Hi, my name is Thane Rosenbaum, and I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And in partnership with our producing partners, IFC Films, uh, welcome to the Folks Film Series. Uh, tonight's film, The Meaning of Hitler. It's an IFC film. It opens uh, on Friday of this week, August 13th, uh, 13th, Friday the 13th. And it's also available on Apple uh, TV on uh, August 13th. Um, we have with us uh, uh, the two directors of the film, who you'll meet in a moment, uh, Michael Tucker and Petra Epperlein. Uh, you will notice that they are sharing the same screen. It's partly because they're directors of the same film, and they happen to be married. Uh, and this is a marriage that's clearly working, so we just want to support that also. Um, this is a, an important film uh, that deals with the ongoing cultural fascination with Adolf Hitler and how he's often portrayed and remembered and how perhaps the Holocaust is understood through the way he's portrayed and remembered. And the fact that he still somehow, the ghosts of Hitler somehow resurfaces uh, time and again. Um, and this film really captures a lot of that, uh, the, the mystery of him and the ambivalence that we have in paying this much attention to him. Uh, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, uh, welcome. We love that you're watching us on Facebook. We're a growing audience there. Please come to folks.org also to give us your uh, email information so we can give you advance notice of future uh, films. Uh, and uh, if you have a question uh, uh, for Michael or Petra, uh, many of you have already seen the film. I think you can still watch it if there's still room for tonight on our links uh, until 11 p.m. tonight. Uh, but if you've seen the film, you know it's an important film, surely tell people about it. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a film worth watching. If you have a question for Michael or Petra, leave it in the Q&A box uh, and I will uh, hopefully get to it. Um, so uh, let's just let's say hello to Michael uh, and, and Petra. Where are they? Are they there? I said they are. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, that's Michael Tucker and Petra uh, uh, Epperlein. Um, I, I, I'll tell you, there's another good luck charm that's about this film that's faded. Uh, 15 years ago, we did an event, uh, the only other time that we had a married couple. Uh, and you know what his name was? Michael Tucker. Me. You know, that's, what are the odds of that, Michael? The, yeah, there was Michael Tucker and Jill Eikenberry who were a married couple that also co-starred in the television show, LA Law. And we talked, we had a discussion. I don't know if you know him. Uh, well, I can tell you that Michael Tucker from LA Law is like my nemesis because there's a constant <laughs> battle on internet movie database. In fact, if you look on, I think if you look on Rotten Tomatoes internet movie database right now, his picture represents me, <laughs> but my picture never represents him. So did you think this is what I was gonna say when I said there was another Michael Tucker that we posted before? You might not have thought about it. You know, we, this we, has been going on for years, so. <laughs> well, if I see Michael, I'm gonna tell him this anecdote. Um, but so anyway, it's a, good, it's a good sign. It's a healthy sign. If you appeared on folks, there are no odds of that. I was gonna to say to our, our, uh, our engineer, Mara, that she, can, she could cue in the Twilight Zone song at any point because there's just no, <laughs> no odds of that happening. Um, look, this is an interesting time for this film, right? Uh, you have a resurgence of global anti-Semitism. There's authoritarianism, neo-fascism amidst talks of white supremacy and perhaps its connections to discussions about the master race. We're living in a time of the strong man political leader, whether Putin or Modi or Banasaro or Maduro or, um, or uh, uh, let's see, Hungary, who's Hungary? Oh yeah, Orban, of course. Um, and we had Donald Trump. <laughs> so this is a time where the strong man, right, extreme right wing political leader, as well as in Poland, uh, you're seeing this all over. Um, and, and, and other things, you're seeing anti-immigration fervor, ironically coming out of Germany, which was the country that most embraced the Syrian refugees and now uh, they're paying the political price for that. Uh, and so here's a country that had, you know, the, the worst example of xenophobia and uh, nativism uh, who opened its doors to the Syrians and now 
uh, a large number of the population seems to be changing its mind uh, in the, during which the period of the Hamas uh, and Israel Gaza war, uh, I looked this up, there was uh, the meme or the hashtag Hitler was right, was posted 17,000 times, 17,000 times, just, just, just a month ago. On the one hand, this is a, a period of history that we dark period that we wish to forget and we can't forget for so many different reasons. So let me just start off by saying, look, this is a, it's a very important film, uh, but it's, it's also an ambitious film with given its title, the meaning of Hitler, one would think that the meaning itself is elusive, you know, by definition, uh, even the poster of the film, uh, which maybe we'll get to at the end, is, is alluring and, and also uh, elusive. Uh, you talk about in the film that this, there's, that Hitler is oversaturated in so many ways, books, movies, documentaries around the world. Uh, the, your film ironically mentions that and yet it adds to the canon. Why did you make the film? Uh, and in what way does it add to the archive of documentaries about the Third Reich? Well, I think, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned it in your intro. I mean, our start for being interested in this was filming our last film, Karl Marx City. Um, in 2015, we were filming in the former East Germany in Dresden, and we encountered and started filming these incredibly large anti-immigration demonstrations. Um, that would happen on what, Monday nights? They happened on Monday nights and like up to 30,000 people with tiki torches were marching across towns and they were chanting, amongst many other things, they were chanting lying press. Um, lying press is a phrase directly borrowed from Nazi language. And L L L Lügenpresse, right? Exactly, Lügenpresse. And uh, that was extremely disturbing. And that was actually the first time we personally experienced the, the new representation of that, of that kind of hatred, which inspired us to do something about it since we're filmmakers, we make films. And um, yeah. And then do you as, know, I'm just curious. Oh, go ahead, Michael. I was gonna say, and then it was, as we finished our research, Charlottesville happened. And then again, we saw that mirror image of what we had just seen in Germany. How was it tiki, possible? Tiki torches. <laughs> how was it possible that these young Americans were marching through the center of Charlottesville, um, chanting, Jews will not replace us, blood and soil? Um, and they were actually very giddy about it. And it, it, it was, um, you know, I think when we started, a lot of this was theoretical. And of course, now when we look uh, four years later, you know, all of this has become, I mean, incredibly real and incredibly pressing. I mean, before it was just sort of like, well, maybe this might happen, but these things have happened now and um, it feels more urgent than ever. So I, I, help me remember uh, the incident that happened on New Year's Day in Germany uh, with the sort of mass rapes around the country. Do you remember that anecdote? Yeah. I'm wondering whether that was around that same time too? Yes. It was. Because I'm wondering whether that's where the words lying press came from. I think there was a, it, it started before already. I think these, these uh, demonstrate these marches, they were calling them, and not actually marches, they were calling them walks, spaziergang. Ah. And they happened every, every Monday, I think, like for a long, longer period of time, accumulating into uh, like masses um, yeah. behind that. And I think there is where it, really actually started, but it became a kind of a rallying cry across many forces. I mean, that movement, Pegida, I think started before all the events around New Year's that were, you know, very, um, that really sort of exploded in the media. I think, I think that actually the event started in October or November. Yeah. Well, look, just for in case there's, our audience is super smart. They know a lot, um, but in case for the few of them who might not, I'm referring to um, a, a New Year's Eve incidents where a, a number of Muslim men around Germany, many of whom may have in fact been recent uh, uh, refugees that had been welcomed into Germany, committed sexual assaults around the country and the press didn't cover it. And they didn't really give it widespread coverage until April. 
And so, and the reason for that was because the press really was in favor of the immigration policies of President Chancellor Merkel. Uh, and so there, there was an outcry uh, by April that says, well, how come we didn't know about this? Uh, and so when, when Michael and Petra were, giving, were telling this anecdote, I was just wondering whether it was about that same time because I, I had not heard that. Uh, and by the way, the footage that you used in your film, is it from that earlier film? Um, no, that's not, but I mean, um, I, 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 I'm not really agreeing with um, your assessment that the press didn't cover that because that happened, you know, and um, it was discussed right away because it was pretty, something like that never happened before. And I can't remember that anything like that ever happened, like a mass. So, but what happened was it was happening mostly in Cologne. It's a big city. Yeah. And the, yeah. Of the, um, recent immigrants came on, on New Year's Eve, they were downtown in the middle of the city to celebrate and it got completely out of control and there was yeah. no, was way too little police and... The criticism was also more that the police reporting and the way these incidents were presented, there was um, a lot of controversy about that. I think that's kind of maybe... Yeah. Maybe some so, so let's go back to lying press again. Uh, the film um, raises Donald Trump comes up, in, you know, both explicitly and implicitly, um, because you mentioned lying press, Lumen Pressa, which Hitler was the first one that introduced that phrase, right, to undermine the democratic institutions of Weimar uh, Germany. He referred to the press as the lying press, and there are people who made that association that oh, guess what, Donald Trump used the word fake news. And so when he said fake news, he was picking up where Hitler had left off. I'm curious, I mean, the film clearly doesn't treat it as comparable in any way, um, but it is interesting that a number of the people you spoke to made those associations, the, the commonality in lying, you know, two leaders that, you know, were spent a lot of time lying I, is did you have thoughts about how to present Trump in a film to sort of give it new context, contextualize it to a, a more modernist frame? I mean, first of all, Trump is no Hitler. That's very clear. We really need to say that. And also, um, the film doesn't only address. I mean, of course, you know, it's a it's a more global problem, like these autocrats and these um, backwards movements. They are you can find them pretty much anywhere in the Western world. Um, but then of course, you can always draw parallels from history. That's kind of the point of the film. You know, you should know your history to understand your, the present and, and deal with it. And, um, you know, when Hitler came to power, um, he created chaos. His aim was to destroy the state, the state organism to replace everything with himself to become the ultimate dictator. And um, yeah, when you look at, 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 at what happened um, under Trump's presidency, a lot of chaos was created, you know, and um, a lot of- um, Distrust. Distrust and distraction, uh, this, this destruction was um, created. And um, now we are- left, I also, you know, ahead, sorry. Distrust, the distrust in the media, which was built up over these last years, right now it's at a level which hasn't been seen for a long time. Not only distrust in the media, also into the state itself. So that makes it very complicated and difficult for a democratic state to function if no one trusts anything anymore. I thought there was also a, what was implicit was the way in which, and I thought it was very powerful, the way you, and artful, uh, the way you introduced uh, the Laney Riefenstahl film *Triumph of the Will*, which was a you know captured the 1934 Nuremberg rally, and I think you know although you didn't say it, I think for many Americans they probably thought about you know Donald Trump used to love loves rallies, <laughs> you know he did them all over the country, did them recently, he loves them, um, and there it was I think some for I think for some people watching this film they might have made that connection. I don't know if that was in your mind also, uh, because it was the way, I thought there was also something fascinating the way you showed even the Lion King 
you know, the number of ways in which the, 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 I, the image of Hitler speaking on 1934 at Nuremberg, how that image uh, as an iconic image has found its way into all kinds of art, even animation. Thanks for you. <laughs> we don't have to talk about it, Michael. <laughs> I mean, it's such a big topic. Um... Well, let, let, let's just say, you know, making speeches. I mean, your movie does something that I'd never thought about before, which is Hitler understood how microphones worked. He was interested in sound, right? I mean, I'd never heard that before. The, yeah, I mean, the that's... microphone that he used, you know, you made even association in the film of the, 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 when the Beatles appeared at Shea Stadium that Hitler was perhaps the first person that gave a lot of thought to how microphones work with large crowds. Well, Klaus Heine, the microphone expert that's in the film, I mean, he so smartly says, and kind of you just said it yourself, I mean, Hitler, I mean, not only was he presented to these crowds in a way that had never been experienced before? I mean, suddenly he's speaking in front of hundreds of thousands of people, and there are microphones, not microphones, there are loudspeakers in the audience. Um, Telefunken made these um, loudspeakers that sort of look like flying saucers or lampposts, and they had them throughout the crowd. And so everyone was really feeling Hitler's presence. And so if you're a, a peasant in a small town and suddenly, you know, Hitler rolls up or drops in, in his airplane and is um, speaking to you, I mean, he's really, it's, it's very direct and immediate. But at the same time, Hitler, and I think Trump is really not so dissimilar, they really um, are fueled by these crowds as if they really need them. And that, um, it's fascinating. Yeah, that's, and you shouldn't forget before, so there was this new technology of the microphone and the loudspeaker, and Hitler took advantage of it before that um, technology existed. You know, if a speaker wanted to address a crowd, you, how far can your voice carry? Maybe like 500 people, but suddenly Hitler could speak to 1 million people in Berlin on the airport, and the crowd there has a completely different experience because one million people together, how does that feel? You know, you get the, ex the ecstasy of the experience in the crowd is completely different. And that is the comparison to a Beatles concert, you know, the sheer, yeah, the ecstasy. The which, ecstasy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in fact, you showed, you showed women, you know, looking like they were gonna faint, but not because of Paul McCartney, but because of Adolf Hitler. Yeah. The, the hit that's actually an, an, another interesting little detail that we don't really uh, dwell on too much in the film. So um, Hitler was presented to the German people as the object of desire. I mean, to the, to the German women, you know. Um, during his lifetime, nobody knew about Eva Braun. Nobody knew that. She was kept totally a secret. So he was that single guy and he was basically all German women wanted him. Or well, that's how it was presented which is yeah. an interesting fact, how they fawned over him. She was, she was oddly in the Linda Eastman and Yoko Ono category. Because <laughs> the, the Beatles, Beatles fans also didn't want to know that the boys had boyfriends, right? Uh, girlfriends. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought that that was an, uh, you know, clearly an original thought about, you know, his understanding. You know, we have a series and one of our many different series, we have one called Conversations on Essential Cinema, where we have a special guest talking about a special classic film. And about six or eight months ago, I can't remember, we had uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. And Charlie Chaplin really understood that. He picked up on that. This film was made in 1938 and he realized, because remember how many scenes are there of Hitler at the microphone and the, you know, literally making love to the microphone. And that Chaplin saw that you know the mutual ad adulation of the crowd, the romanticism of the crowd, and also his own romance with his own voice. Um, and yes, I think you're quite right. Unfortunately, it does seem as if you know President Trump was a sucker for love. <laughs> he would get love no matter where he'd go. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why he was not so quick to condemn you know right wing extremism because he just he loved the love. Um, so 20 years ago, around 2002, 2003, 2004, I wrote about 
three different films that came out literally one after another and just one year after uh, 9-11 and then two years and then three years after. One was called Max. Uh, I don't know if you remember that film. Hitler was a failed painter uh, and John Cusack played a guy named Max who was an art gallery dealer who was trying to help out the young Hitler. It was very sympathetic. By the way, Max was Jewish and he was trying to help out the young Hitler. I think it was purely fictional. Uh, there was a television movie in 2003 in the United States. It was a four part series called Hitler, the Rise of Evil. And then of course there was the German film Downfall. And uh, that, I, I forgot what it's the German, is it Untergang or what is it? Yeah, Untergang, yes. Untergang, right. Anyway, one of the things I remembered saying, this is 20 years ago now, I remembered saying, well, you know, people now have to question whether these three films humanized Hitler in a way that we'd never seen before. You know, these films showed Hitler as a lover of dogs. He was really good with little kids. He was very avuncular. He was really nice to his secretaries and they adored him. I think they even sat on his lap and they never once complained for sexual harassment. Um, and, and we saw him in these humanizing ways and I thought, well, you know, we'd, we'd never seen that before. Aren't we supposed to only think of him as evil? So I'm curious as filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, but artful ones, because your films have a, a, per, a testimonial purpose, but there's also an aesthetic impulse there. Uh, believe me, if people see your, this movie, they're gonna see that you know, Petra and Michael make you know, interesting looking films. And they make have interesting choices in what how they choose to edit those films. Do you have a view of you know the relationship between uh, art and atrocity, or how Hitler? You know, let me just put it this way: If I was pitching a movie now to a Hollywood studio and said I want to make a movie about Osama bin Laden, and I want to show him as a young man, confused, and maybe he was a waiter at the World Trade Center. Who knows? You know, and some weird connections. And then all of a sudden, 20 some odd years later, he leads this horrendous terrorist attack in the United States. I'm assuming that I would never get that movie made, but it does seem at least 20 years ago that we were reaching a point where you could make a more sympathetic film about Hitler. Well, I mean, I think when you start with Downfall, I mean, I mean I've watched all of those films and probably about 150 more. <laughs> we just had a yard sale uh, last year where we had all these Hitler DVDs and Blu-rays and someone sheepishly came up and bought all of them and was like, they're for my mother, you know, yeah. like, can I put them in a <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I mean, know. see, these are all people who knew you were working on a movie and they said, you really need to see this. They kept showing you more stuff to see. No, so we, we, we had to watch it all and we pulled clips, but I mean, I don't think people, I mean, I think, <clears throat> You know, Downfall, Bruno Ganz, his performance is fantastic. But I mean, that movie is such a piece of revisionism, not just about Hitler, but also the, the sort of like letting Germans off in the end. You know, you see the secretary and the young boy, you know, going off together and like they're sort of washed clean of all complicity. I mean, it's a pretty offensive film. And in fact, um, People can probably search for this. I wish I had a link, but Vin Benders wrote this scathing essay about it, which is really he, fascinating. Because Bruno, because Bruno Gunn started in it, right? Aren't that wasn't he's his leading actor in Wings of Desire? Started it. I mean, it's a scathing, it's a scathing essay. But he also wrote an essay in the seventies when um, Joachim Fest made a film called Hitler: A Career, which you can still watch on Netflix. And that premiered at the Berlin Film Festival, and it was this really big budget documentary, and it sort of presented Hitler as a, you know, sort of like a celebrity, almost as like a superstar, a pop star. And vendors also went after that, um, and that was sort of like the beginning of what they called the Hitler wave, you know, when Hitler when, was really being rehabilitated and rethought and kind of that sympathetic Hitler was showing up. I mean, earlier versions of Hitler were always more sinister. Um, yeah, I think it's hugely problematic. So you have to wonder, like a film like um, Downfall, what does that film trying to achieve? I mean, why do we need to, what, what's the point of seeing Hitler as a, 
as a human do we need to understand or oh, he was just like like us that's probably not so terrible because that shows us actually that that uh, evil sits inside of all of us it could happen to anyone and hitler wasn't special we just allowed him to do the things we are all complicit in it but then the film ultimately has this problem this is what Wim Wenders takes um, issue with it um, that at the end you know you grant Hitler his wish that you don't show him um, committing suicide you know you, yeah. you give him the, the, the dignity to cut uh, to shut the door and we don't see that as exactly as he um, wished for in real life so why do we do that I don't I don't understand that that's and, just wrong and it's something that we cut in the film I mean it was funny going through all these films and of course also going through decades of Holocaust films and seeing also the way that we represent the Holocaust has changed in that, you know, there was just a series last year with Al Pacino about Nazi hunters on Amazon. I mean, yeah. there were disgusting, cruel scenes of death in there that were completely gratuitous and unnecessary. And I can't, I can't believe that someone at Amazon ever greenlit that. Um, like, wh why, you know, we, would, we won't show Hitler's death, but we'll show people being murdered in this, like, cruel, like, I mean, this, like, absolutely obscene pornographic way and consider that entertainment. I mean, that's... It's the, these questions really need to be asked and um, they're not. So, so now's the time again to, I, a lot of our audience probably already knows this and so do you both, but the post-war German philosopher, Theodor Dorno did get into this a little, right? When he said, you know, no poetry after Auschwitz or to make poetry after Auschwitz is barbarism. It sounds when listening to the two of you that you're sympathetic to that that at the same time you recognize the power of art, you also know that it's, it, it could be weaponized in a way that can be transgressive, right? That can actually, you know, you know be in a, you know, a kind of a moral sin. Uh, do you feel that way? Do you agree with what Adorno said? Artists have grappled with this question for years, uh, you know, this idea of, can you make a movie about the Holocaust itself? Not about the aftermath or not about before, but the events themselves. Can you make, and for the most part, most artists, you know, certainly, you know, did not go into the camps, the death camps. Schindler's List goes in very briefly. And by the way, it's just a cheap shot in that one where he goes in and they turn on the shower and their actual showers was the one. Um, but, you know, there are people that to this day, the Roman Polanski film, you know, Pianist. There are people who have written, I've written, questioned these films. Do you, as artists and as people who take this material very sensitively, do you, do you want to weigh in on the Adorno quote, no poetry after Auschwitz? Well, it's funny when you watch Shoah and then you read about Cloud Landsman. I mean, Cloud Landsman is a pretty, you know, he's quite a, you know, the lion of the film director, but you know, there's parts of it when you, when you if you don't, if you don't examine it closely, it gets, you know, his positions on things could be really kind of annoying. Um, like he was absolute about it. He was like, you know, if there was footage of um, actual gassings, he would destroy it. Um, Even though those would be testimonial, right? That's not, a, that's not about aesthetics. I mean, that raises separate questions that the mere filming of it by itself, even if it's not with makeup, right, and lighting, even if just filming it, it can't be shown. Do you feel that way, Michael? Do you, do you think that that's what Lanzmann was saying? I don't, really, I don't really think either of us have any strong, like what can or cannot be done because anything can be done in art. But I think it's like, there's a, I mean, I have to say for myself, it was only until you went to Sobibor. I mean, I had never been to an extermination camp and we've been there twice and spent a lot of time just standing in the forest it is really hard to grasp. I mean, there's, it's not a place of like monuments or um, it's a place that tourists don't really go. In fact, the, the, the guest center was being rebuilt while we were there. Um, and we sort of, you know, kind of went in the back way, but it's very, um, it, it is incredibly powerful and it's, you have to grapple. And you can see when you look at the footage that Landsman shot there, that he was grappling with this. And I think in many ways, um, you know, it, it, it can make someone go mad. But maybe we 
Maybe we should um, discuss this also a little bit um, from a from a different angle, because what do we have? So talking about the death camps in Eastern Europe, um, you know, the Nazis went to great lengths to destroy all traces of what they did there. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, they didn't really succeed, but they did destroy a lot of stuff. And the same um, similar thing happened actually in the um, audiovisual materials, what we have from the times, you know, the Nazis produced a lot of um, visually stunning propaganda footage. Ultimately, everything is propaganda footage. What Leni Riefenstahl made, all of it is propaganda, and it should always be seen as propaganda. At the same time, the Nazis made sure that basically almost no footage exists of um, their crimes, of the killings, you know, because yeah. that's not what they wanted to perpetrate into the future. They wanted to present themselves as these, uh, in this heroic, uh, visually attractive way, which they did. And this kind of footage, you know, this is everywhere. We watch it all the time, but we never, we seldom reflect on what it actually, what it actually does. Hmm. It propagates the propaganda into eternity, basically. Hmm. Interesting. Hey, Patrick, I wanna go back to something you said a moment ago when you introduced the idea, well, why should, when you mentioned downfall, you said, you know, why should we ever look at him in human terms, that he has qualities just like us, right? And that's an interesting question, right? Because, well, are we deeming him, are we deeming Hitler evil that he, you know, evil resists the temptation to know, right? That we, we have a temptation to know, but we can't, we couldn't possibly, you know, understand because, you know, you could argue that he was a human aberration fully inhuman. Uh, but at the same time, if you did that, then you could say, well, look, there's nothing for us to discuss because we couldn't possibly understand him anyway. You just made a movie called The Meaning of Hitler. I'm gonna ask you in a second, I'll ask you right now, what is the meaning of Hitler? Because given what we just, we talked about before, right? You know, if, we, if, we, if we're trying to understand the meaning of Hitler, are we trying to understand the man? Are we trying to understand the moment? Understanding the man goes to the point that you were making. Like, well, look, he's not like us. We can't humanize him. No, that's, uh, not, that's, that's actually not. I think if you go back to the film, um, it's one of the first people we met was Yehuda Bauer, who in Jerusalem, who's 96 now. He's probably yeah. the world's greatest living Holocaust historian. And um, we sort of like asked him directly this question. And he's like, well, I don't think it's really that complicated. You know, and I, and I think... It's reducing it. It's not that you can't, if you want to watch Downfall, if you want to make down, uh, Downfall, good, all the power to you, you know? But like, do, um, do we need to see a humanized Hitler? Do we need to see, um, you know, Hitler with his dog and, you know, with the baby and, you know, the whole, I don't, I think it's completely unnecessary. And I think it actually puts us further away from the idea that um, yeah, Hitler is a person, and he did these things, and Nazis were people, and they did these things. Um, we've actually created a gap to it, and I feel like what Downfall does is actually creates even a further gap by saying, well, that was Hitler, and these were the ordinary Germans, and that's where the revisionism lives. I see. So let, let's go back to the title, The Meaning of Hitler. D did you set out to answer the question, if there was a question? Do you think there is an answer? Do you did you discover both of you as filmmakers meaning through the process? So the, the title comes directly from the book by uh, Sebastian Hoffner, yeah. Hitler, which was published in the late 70s, yeah. mm -hmm. right on the uh, uh, cusp of the uh, hit the first Hitler wave when Hitler right. became like this pop culture icon. And what sets this book apart from um, all these many, many others, which are like, I don't know, thousands of pages thick, uh, thick um, is that he um, doesn't look as on Hitler's, he doesn't, uh, isn't concerned about Hitler's uh, characterology. He's um, concerned about actually what Hitler did that sets it apart. And um, ultimately that's the meaning, it doesn't, it is not important to understand who the man was. I mean, we kind of make fun of that in the film. Right. We need to understand, as Yehuda Bauer tells us, that he's just a man as we all. And um, so we have to face our own complicity. I mean, not personally ours, but like he didn't operate in a vacuum. You know, he was enabled by many people. 
And um, that's ultimately it. So you have a number of Holocaust historians, Saul Friedlander, um, Deborah Lipstadt, who's been a guest of folks a number of times, um, uh, my friend Jan Gross, uh, who from Poland and Princeton, um, and of course Yehuda Bauer. But David Irving is there. Uh, most probably a many number of people in our audience know, he's probably the world's most famous Holocaust denier, anti-Semite. Uh, he was the, he co-starred in a feature film uh, that Rachel Weitz starred in playing the role of uh, uh, Deborah Lipstadt called Denial, was, pub, uh, was released a few years ago. Was there hesitation to show Irving, to put him in the film? I mean, you didn't elevate him in any way. He looks ridiculous. He does say two bizarrely interesting things that I, you know, like... <laughs> Uh, the, the question that he says that Jews never really ask themselves, why us? Did he answer that question? And did you just leave it out of the movie? Because I was fascinated that he was mocking the question. Like, what, you know, of course it's you and you give, why, did, why shouldn't you ask why it's you? It's always you, therefore it's your fault. I wonder if there was more to that than that. I mean, you, you gave him, uh, he's in the movie, he's, but he looks ridiculous and you made, you made some decisions to, to use him. Well, first, I mean, it was a long... Uh, it was a difficult discussion to, um, to see if we should um, reach out to him, if he should be included in the film. Um, Sebastian Hafner was one of the first who actually took, took issue with his... Um, with, the, with his denial of history, his attempt to rewrite history um, and in the book uh, back in the 70s. And so we finally decided to reach out to him and, and um, talk to him. And um, yeah, so we met him um, on his so-called uh, real history tour in Poland um, in a concentration camp. This was a Treblinka, or this was a Treblinka, right? Or Sobibor. In a death camp. And yeah. uh, so he gives this tour and he uh, mocks. I mean, what you see in the film, that's what he does, you know? I think there was oh. a lot of question when he invited us to meet him there on his real history tour. And the first thing that came to our mind is, is you know, how is it possible that David Irving is taking a bus tour through Poland? <laughs> like how, how was that? I mean, in what year was that? In 20, 2018. 18, yeah. So it was 2018. So people have tried to stop him before. I mean, he's banned from many countries. He was in jail in Austria. Um, I think he is now banned from one of the Baltic states. Uh, people have tried to get him banned from Poland, but still um, no action is taken. So how is that possible? Um, and so what's happening there? And, uh, you know, as you see in the film, it, it was pretty once, once no one thought that they were being um, filmed, they just sort of, their true thing came up. And I think it helped, capturing that helped support what Lipstadt is talking about in the film. And then it's also expressing this idea. I mean, the cruelty is the point. I mean, yeah. it's not, denial is, uh, Denials, whatever. I mean, there, there's not a. This is not a fact-based uh, thing. This is not even a really an argument. It's really about cruelty. It's just about inflicting this pain over and over and over again, just by denying it. It's hurtful, um, and you see that, and you feel that, and it, it um, actually, I think of anything that we filmed in all the years we've been making films. It's probably the most disturbing thing. It was really hard to um, walk walk, walk away from that. Well, you in the film, you you you. There are some not not just Irving, but there are some younger people, neo Nazis, talking about their, you know, the Holocaust never happened. We 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 have some youth there. You also venture in. I admired this into the big tech argument. Uh, I really admired what you did. You know, to me, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's quote about why he doesn't take down neo Nazi or Holocaust denial websites is that we don't, he says, I think it's, it's a quote that you have in the film, I think it's the quote. He says, well, I, we don't punish people for getting things wrong. I think that's his actual quote, getting things wrong. And I remember when I heard that initially, I remember I 
I think I wrote about it for somewhere. And thought, God, this is this is a perfect example of the writ, the problems if you don't graduate college. Uh, you know that this is. I mean, he, he's a billionaire, but he didn't actually read any books. He's not. I just find it appalling that he actually thinks the problem with the neo Nazis or Holocaust deniers that they just don't know. And if they had more information, you reminded me of this when you said about Deborah Lipstadt saying it's about the cruelty, right? It's about hurting people. It's like saying this didn't happen. I don't care if I know it happened. I know it's going to hurt you by saying it didn't happen because it happened, but I'm just going to hurt you repeatedly. And so that Zuckerberg thinks it's just misinformation. If they'd simply read a couple more books, then they wouldn't be this way. They would love Jews and they wouldn't want to hurt anybody, but they're, they, they're misinformed. And I, I love that you did that because I felt that Zuckerberg has gotten a pass in a way and your film didn't give him a pass. So thank you uh, for that. Um, it's also ahead. funny, if you look at German companies, like say often a German company will be asked to deal with its past. And one of the things they'll do is they'll hire historians. I think it'd be so great if Facebook was forced to reckon with this stupidity and you would sort yes. of in like a Friedlander and a Lipstadt and a Bauer, and they would, you know, just yeah. give him the talking to that he needs, the education, because it's so, um, yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, and, and look where we are now. And I think yeah. that's the extension <laughs> is all of this dis disinformation has created this catastrophe. Um, how many hundreds of thousands of people have died worldwide just because of sheer stupidity. Yeah, no, they, the Facebook, Facebook's tolerance for this is, is, is astounding. All social media is astounding. Um, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to be regulated and they want to act, you know, they do censor some people, uh, but they seem to have, you know, sympathy for neo-Nazis and you know, <laughs> people who deny epidemics and, you know, there, there's a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very frightening. And yes, it's, it's, it's obvious. And yet it's being treated as if it's, you know, rocket science that look, they just don't know. And we're not in the business of teaching them. Uh, they're just misinformed and we wouldn't take any of their, their, uh, their pages down. Um, how about the, the, the film, you know, comes up at the, the, this just perfect and most imperfect time. You know, there is a time where you know, there's rising, we're in a lifetime now of rising nationalism. Uh, and there's, as you would say, stunning ignorance, the film talks about it as well, about what happened and how it could happen again. Um, do you think that, do you have aspirations that, you know, a documentary, which has, again, testimonial, uh, you know, imperatives and aesthetic ones, that this can actually help inform the world, teach the world, uh, change the course of history. Uh, you know, I often ask artists this, you know, people who make films, you know, what do you think you're doing? Do you actually think that this matters in such a way that you can say, look, you know, this is how we did, this is how this one married art, you know, very uh, artistic couple, this is how they, you know, that this is what they left for the world. Do you see, because we're, we're in a time that really needs it. You both know it. And I'm wondering, does IFC have this aspiration, the, your, you know, the producers of this film, that we want people to see this because we want them to know? Um, yeah, I think it's not about our legacy. It's about, you know, we as people, we want to contribute to the conversation of society. And that's what we want to contribute. And um, of course, the more people uh, watch the film and talk about one of the many um issues and themes that are in there the better it, it it would be because you know it needs to be discussed no matter what their political um ally alliances um are so that's yes that's what we want we want to contribute i mean you want to have this pressing conversation but it's funny like since we started making films people all often ask that question and <laughs> you know we made all these iraq war movies and it was sort of like you finally come to the conclusion, um, maybe it's a function of getting old, but it's like, you know, movies don't change the world. I mean, people do. And this whole idea of like social issue documentary, I mean, yes, can it spark a conversation? Can it make people think? Can they, um, can people talk about it in their homes? That's, that, that's great. That's what it kind of should do. But the thing itself is just the thing, you know? Yeah. It ignites yeah. a little bit of a conversation. 
Yeah, Michael, I, I, you know, I appreciate the modesty there, but let me just say, we, we, are, we are living in a visual culture. You both know this. Uh, Hitler today would be interested in TikTok. He would be less interested in microphones, I think. He'd still know a lot about the power of his voice, but he would know the power of, of video or visuals. You both are filmmakers. People, I'm an author. I understand that your world receives far more attention than my world. And so therefore, if anyone is gonna make a bigger difference, it's not gonna be the power of the pen. I wish it was. I think it's more likely that people that create in the visual medium has a have a better chance of changing minds if you think that it has the potential to do it. If you think that that's what, yeah, you know, again, I know you're both modest, but it's part of your aspiration by saying we're not the only ones. We think that there's a lot of art that's out there that has this value and we must continue presenting it and producing it and creating because this is how people will know. They won't know from reading history books. They won't know from journalism. They'll know from art. I hope so. I hope you're right, actually. That would be ultimately the best outcome. So millions of people should watch the movie and discuss it. <laughs> yeah. or, well, or we should condense it into a TikTok video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do you, you, you mentioned Poland and in Poland, I, I've written about this too, so much about their, you know, their, their you know, they have new crimes now, of, you know, putting them as complicit with the Nazis is a crime in Poland. You can be prosecuted for presenting Poland in any uh, 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 way other than as victims and not as accomplices or abettors. Um, why is it that you think in your experiences in making this film that forgetting amnesia, re revisionist history is such a powerful thing? You know, in Turkey, uh, you can still go to jail from writing something that uh, offends Turkishness, which they mean to be talking about the Armenian genocide. If you talk about the Armenian genocide in Turkey, I think you violate rule 110 of the penal code and you're in jail. Uh, Palmuk, who was a Nobel Prize winning novelist, was almost put in jail because one of his novels referred to the Armenian genocide. Uh, why, what did, you, what did you, what's your sense of why is it so important to revise, rewrite, whitewash history? Why can't people just say, yeah, we did this. This this happened on our land. My grandfather was involved in it, in fact. Well, you know, me as a German, um, who we all had to uh, come to terms with the past in a, how do you even say that correctly? So this is a very difficult thing to admit that you are responsible, that you are part of um, some extremely um, terrible crime that was committed and it's always easier to try to to avoid that you know and as a nation um, so the Germans didn't have a chance to 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 do that but um, nations you know but to different ways to to deal with this and um, to to argue against that and to fight against this rewriting of history is very important I mean we see it Okay, so we see it with this far, relatively far away history, but we see it also how it happens under our eyes, basically, you know? Um, what happened on January 6th uh, in, in DC happened, but there are like all these forces trying to tell us that this actually didn't happen. And that mm -hmm. was just very recently. So what will happen five years from now? What kind of history will we have told for it? In fact, before we came on the, um... On this program tonight, I saw that Trump had just made a statement regarding Ashley Babbitt, you know, where it sort of like twisted it around where the officer who shot her, he says that everyone knows who he is. Um, and so he's sort of become the perpetrator and she's become the victim. So the yeah. man who defended a democratic institution is suddenly portrayed portrayed as the criminal. So that's completely wrong, you know? Like, if we, if this happens under our watch, that this history is being told that way, I mean, that would be really terrible, so. I mean, this is probably all we should be talking about all the time right now. I mean, the fact that this is not going through a process, I mean, that we can't, that we can't simply can't even agree on what we witnessed that day. And some people don't even want to have the discussion. I mean, I think, what was Ted Cruz doing, playing basketball or something? So it, it's, um, 
yeah, sure, we showed things like Poland in the film, but it was shocking as we finished the film to see it happen here. I mean, yeah, it premiered in New York in November, and then January happened, and it was like this is this is like unbelievable. But you know, it, again, it's an interesting impulse because in some of these cases, you're talking about two generations now, right? You know, saying you know why can't you recognize that this was done under your grandparents' watch, right? This isn't even blaming you. It it doesn't mean that you still don't have moral responsibility because you're a German or you're an American. You know, I, mean, I would think you could make the argument that there's a moral responsibility. You know, if you're just from the American South, it's not your fault what happened at plantations with slavery, but you recognize this is where I was born. It's the region. People are very resistant to the idea of even moral responsibility. Forget legal culpability, just we don't want to know anything bad ab about our history. And but when, when you, I want you to answer that question, but I also want to say, since, since Petra is German, I want to say, I don't think Germany gets enough credit. I don't know of any country that has spent more time examining morally, sc scrutinizing the moral failures during that period of time. More books, more movies, more documentaries, more oral testimonies, yes, glitches everywhere, but I don't think the United States in any way has done the same with Native Indian Americans or African Americans. I don't. I'm curious what you would say to this. Do you think that I'm over-crediting Germany? Yeah, I totally think so. I mean, Germany oh, doesn't- this is great. For that, um, it's the Wait, most- no, I think I lost you. You said, you said, I don't want me, I want to make sure the audience got everything you just said. You said, I think, yes. And then you said, what? Germany does not deserve any special credit for uh, how it deals with its past because that's the only that's the only thing Germany could have done and should be doing for eternity. It should never do anything else. That's just the way it is. You know, there's a responsibility, but we as a nation have. That's just the way it is. And other nations and you know also the results of that they are not perfect it's not i mean there's anti-semitism in germany there is racism in germany it's not like germans are perfect people just because wanted, of that i mean i wanted to mention something that we just noticed having moved back to berlin after being in new york you know for 15 years is that you know when you you know if you know if you're jewish in new york and you chose to wear a kippa i mean there are very few people that do that. I mean, there are people wearing baseball caps or- In Berlin. I mean, there are people that, I mean, this is this is not a paranoia. This is a very real fear of being attacked. And so- Yeah, but Michael, can I, I'm gonna say something you're not gonna to wanna to hear, but my audience is, would, you know, but the, those numbers are increasingly Muslims. They're not Germans. Oh, the, um, the attacks, I, the attacks on Jews, the attacks on Jews in Germany are large. Now, I'm not saying there's no right wing fanaticism. Of course, there are. But to say that is not quite related to the same narrative that we're talking about in the meaning of Hitler. I'm, I'm not. I mean, I would debate that. Actually. Israel plays a role in that. I don't know the numbers, but um, there are many, many um, just plain white Germans who are anti Semites and who would act on that. I mean, there are strong. Um, there are strong fascist movements. I mean, they are not like overpowering society, but they exist and they have always existed. And they just now that there is this worldwide movement of resurgence of um, anti-Semitism and authoritarianism, they all feel emboldened to be much stronger. And that's that's certainly a problem of just white Germans. And also scandals within the German, I mean, I just need to you know, clarify, I mean, Germany, there's scandalous things going on with the police forces. I mean, it's they, they are the, the, not only with their police force, with their special forces like KSK. I mean, they are filled with Nazis who have weapons. I mean, this is not, these are also, there's a clip of it in the film, the young man who attacked the synagogue in Halle. Yeah. I mean, that, um, I mean, th there's, and to your point, the failure of the society, you know, with um, with this welcome culture, to also say, you know what, you're in Germany now, and you know it's been this has been going on for a while. Yeah, it's also the responsibility of the society to make sure that newcomers to the society understand 
that the, these behaviors will not be tolerated. Um, I love just, that. I absolutely I, love that idea. Um, I mean, I mean, Berlin overall is a very, very tolerant place. And that's why it shocked me to suddenly see this and realize it um, and witness it and go like, you know, this is, this is like, this is off, you know? Yeah. No, I, I, I um, no, I love that idea that, you know, if, if there's going to be one European country that's not going to tolerate it, it's us, right? The Germans are going to say, look, this is not something, welcome to work, welcome to Germany, but here's one thing that can't happen here because we, we take that very seriously. All I want to say about uh, responding to uh, Petra, yeah, it's, I, under, I appreciate what you said about, look, we, we don't give Germans more credit, but I have a feeling that the Germans will embrace your film, that a lot of people will watch it and will, you know, there'll be a lot of interest in the film. I mean, Germans seem to not be, you know, they can't seem to get enough about, again, I'm not exonerating them, but I am saying the sheer volume of production I find I've always been impressed with about, you know, they just, there's just more books, more memoirs, more documentaries, more, you know, more museums, uh, which doesn't exonerate them. It doesn't, I wrote an op-ed many years ago um, when the Holocaust Museum was built in Berlin about, I don't remember the Degusa scandal with the uh, graffiti that was the anti-graffiti chemical that was being used. It turns out the Degusa, the company that had it, their forebear, the, the successor company to Farben that made Zyklon B. And so there were Germans that said, well, then we should rip out the foundations of the museum because it's poisoned by the fact that this company that's now doing Holocaust restitution is the, you know, the successor corporation of the ones that also made Zyklon B. Only in Germany could this you know, paradox happen uh, and the fact that the Germans were really stuck not knowing what to do. That's not a question Americans worry about. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't have those kinds of philosophical debates. And I, I, I remember thinking, oh, well, at least the Germans are willing to have it. Let's take a question from the audience and then we'll maybe get one more and then we'll say goodnight to Michael and Petra. This comes from uh, Jay Mendez. And I don't know where he or she is from, but it says, uh, aren't policies and actions supported by Hitler inseparable from German anti-Semitism, authoritarian attraction. I think this is the sort of argument to say that Hitler was important, but not singular, that the, 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 he could only take a country to go in a direction it was willing to go anyway. I think that's the question. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if Germany has a special um, um, authority. Uh, um, I not think about anti-Semitism fallacy to 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 follow authority it was a very special the 30s was a very special situation in germany it had just um lost uh world war one and there was a um perceived victimhood in a large part of um society and hitler tapped into that you know and anti-semitism was always strong but it was also strong in other places but hitler really um utilize that for um, to mobilize the people and to mobilize them behind um, him. So I don't, I personally don't really think that this could have happened only there. Maybe in that particular uh, historical situation as it was, it could have happened only there and um, in Germany. Okay, uh, one last question and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, this comes from uh, Nissan Hershkowitz, uh, who says, Nathan Hershkowitz, uh, I remember Downfall's producer explaining that he could not show Hitler's corpse because it would be too traumatic for Germans to see their head of state, uh, even as evil as he was. My question, what are the thoughts of our producers? He, they, he means you both. Would they elaborate on what they expressed in the film about showing Hitler dead? So there's a scene, maybe you could just set that up. There's a scene about discussing about, you know, what the, after the bunker, what, what happened to Hitler? Yeah, it's basically a little bit what we referred to earlier. No, no, why um, do we grant Hitler the dignity that to not show him as in death? He, um, I mean, he also, he actually had sort of his last testament. I mean, he didn't want to be, you know, dragged out, uh, by the um, 
you know, by the Soviets or the masses, you know, paraded through the streets. That's why they burned his body, did all this stuff. But um, he wanted to be um, spared that disgrace. And yet always in the film, the camera pans away. Yeah. I, Sometimes you see like blood hit the wall or something or the, the gun fall or he bites down on the capsule. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of many different versions of what happened in there. And yet- It was a nice montage that you did. Right. Yeah. I mean, we looked at hundreds of films um, to find that stuff. But again, it goes back to, you know, how, how do we represent the Holocaust? You know, somehow we, we, we've picked these scenes, you know, which often, um, they're, they're often very moving because it, they, they, you know, something like a Schindler's List because it captures violence, but is it really necessary when we're not, um, yeah, how, how, do we, how do we view this history? Um, and when does it just sort of become a kind of pornography? Only really Quentin Tarantino, I mean, I personally like Inglorious Bastards because it's, it's this fantasy and, and Hitler, you know, he, he, you know, he dies a really- Yes. It's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a clean ending. Right. That's, that is a, a, Michael, that was a wonderful way to end tonight. So thank you. I like that. Good question. Good answer. Um, let's see, before we say goodnight to Petra and Michael, remember the film opens on Friday the 13th this week. Uh, you can watch it on Apple TV. Uh, I know several hundred of you watched it with us. There's more people out there who now, I hope you're intrigued enough to watch it, if you can watch it. Uh, it opens uh, on, at the IFC Theater um, here in New York, and you'll, it'll probably have other openings as well. Um, and of course, on, you know, nowadays during the pandemic, Apple TV. So the film is The Meaning of Hitler. Uh, you, you've met uh, Petra and Michael, and it's really, you should also check out their earlier documentaries. They're extremely talented, and this film is a good showcase for what they're able to do. Let's just uh, do some closing announcements. Uh, let's see, we have some upcoming events. Uh, yes, you know, our uh, incredibly celebrated annual uh, Folks International Short Film Competition. Uh, we're accepting submissions. Uh, there's the early bird, August 1st. I think it runs throughout the month. Uh, as you know, for those who've been following us, you know, we have films from all over the world, South Korea, Turkey. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what was uh, Iran last year. Uh, and it's really wonderful. It's uh, films that all have a sort of human rights, moral justice theme, uh, social justice theme. And it, it's a great way to support uh, young filmmakers. And we have some special prizes this year that have to do with uh, the New York uh, Film Academy, uh, which is one of our co-sponsors. So some of the filmmakers will be able to take some scholarships, uh, take advantage of, the, of it there. So uh, if you know any young filmmakers or old filmmakers, uh, you know, have them... Uh, submit. So that's, that's up now. We have an event tomorrow night, I think. Mara, let's get that going. Crime on the Bayou. Uh, and we have the um, film's director, Nancy Bursky. Uh, and we also have a civil rights legend, uh, Gary Duncan. His case uh, from Louisiana went all the way to the Supreme Court. It actually generated two different cases. He's still alive. He was a young man uh, during the civil rights era. And is, uh, it's really a powerful movie about what happened uh, to an African American in a in a in a, a hamlet of outside of New Orleans uh, that was not atypical. You know, we oftentimes know of the three who were killed in Mississippi, or the the girls that were killed in the uh, Birmingham uh, bombing of the church. Uh, but this was another story that ha happened to Gary Duncan um, that really just is just really just so shocking that is another reason to watch this movie. Movie, and if you Tune in tomorrow night, you'll, you'll get to see the, the living uh, uh, Gary Duncan. Um, let's see, before we uh, say goodnight, I think you see to the right of your screen, we have a donation button. As you know, folks, we haven't shut down from uh, the beginning of the pandemic and we haven't charged any ticket prices. So now's a good time to support cultural institutions that have been with you, uh, you know, giving you, giving life to the mind during a time when everybody's sheltering at home. So. That, that button is there, it never goes away now. It's a whole new look. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you can uh, donate, we'd appreciate it. Uh, Petra, Michael, uh, good luck to you both with the film. Uh, really, we enjoyed having you. I think we'll probably have you back. Uh, there was a lot of questions we didn't get to. The chat box is just filled with people talking to each other, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so you generated a lot of interest. You're both charming and smart and talented. 
and we're looking forward and we're, we're big fans of IFC with their partners of ours. So this is a, this is a hit. We're, we're really standing behind the film. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow night. My name is Thane Rosenbaum from Folks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, guys.